and welcome to 9 to 42, the podcast from the team at the Guitar Show UK. Join us for interviews, updates and chat with artists, influencers and those that manufacture the gear that we love. Hello and welcome to 9 to 42, which is the podcast from the guys at the Guitar Show UK. Uh, my exceptionally good friend, Jace, is on the screen. Uh, Jace, how the devil are you? I'm really good, mate. Thank you. How are you? Uh, well, I'm full of cold, actually, truth be known. Yeah, uh, me too. Uh, and I had that proper man flu day yesterday where I was just <laughs> pathetic. I was pathetic yesterday. Um, but my wife's lost all interest now, so there's no point actually even doing that anymore. I had to just get on with it today because th- there's no crowd to play to. Oh, well, I, I haven't done that thing. I've just carried on. Really? Yeah. I don't know. know if, I'm not sure if I believe that. No, no. No, I have just carried on. Right. Not moaning at right. all right. about the fact that I've got a headache that hasn't gone for two days because right. of the pressure. Right. So just share it with our audience then. Yeah. That's where yeah. you're getting your therapy. Okay, that's fine. Um, we are joined today, uh, and, and we've only been trying to get this person on the podcast since pretty much when we started. Uh, not saying that she's elusive, but we've, we're joined by Hannah Trigwell. Hannah, how are you? Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. How are you? I'm not elusive, am I? Am I? Um. <laughs> I don't know. You can have flaky if you like. Which do you prefer? <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> no, it's it's nice to it's nice to be here. We don't have any tea cakes, but maybe that can be rectified. I know. I feel bad that I should have arranged to have something sent to you. Really, um, I know. if you'd have said that we would have had tea cakes, I might have committed earlier. Earlier on, yeah. <laughs> Han- Hannah and I have a, have a tea and toasted tea cake history, yeah, uh, and a fish game history, and yeah. We have a we have a strange kind of the dark backstory. History. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I remember you once sending me a WhatsApp message that said something like "Get out quick, save yourself." I can't remember in what context. <laughs> what was that? Was that at? Um, I think it was the at Jazz Festival. I think that was at Jazz Festival. Yeah, at Montreux yeah, years and years and years. Yeah, we uh, were a bit fair, hungover. A jazz Festival yeah. would. Um, but have me running for the door as well. Oh no, it was fantastic. No, we, uh, did, back, do you back know what? In... Such a lack of jazz, wasn't there? Oh, there was no jazz at all. <laughs> it was great. It was, there was no, no jazz at all. It was fantastic. We just we just had a, a, a company credit card. We had this magic card that worked at the bar, and you just took it to the bar and you gave it to somebody, and they gave you they gave you champagne. Wow. It was it was fantastic. Stuff of dreams. And we got royally pissed, really. I yeah. seem to recall. Well, I flaked. I flaked about three or four in the morning. I had a voicemail <laughs> from everybody about five saying, where are you? Come back yeah, out. Yeah, we were Which, looking for you. Yeah, I flaked yeah. about about whatever time. And uh, and you carried on You carried on going through till virtually daylight, didn't you? Yeah, I remember coming down for breakfast and seeing you at the table and, and being surprised that you were there. <laughs> Somehow I thought you'd been, like, dragged off to, like, the other side of the city or something. We were like, where's Ant? Where is he? And then you were just there, like, just casually drinking orange juice at the table. Yeah. I'm assuming I, I, this was at uh, Montreux. This was at Montreux, yeah. So yeah. back in the day, for explanation and context, back in the day when I worked for Shaw, we used to do this trip once a year to the Jazz Festival in Montreux because Shaw were a technical partner. And uh, on one of the years, um, Mary Spender, who we've had on the podcast, and myself when she was working with us at Shaw, we put together a kind of an influencers. Um, before influencers was even a word, I think. Uh, this this little trip, which involved people, uh, you know, like Hannah, Rachel Collier was on there. Uh, Paul Davids was on the trip. For those of you who know Paul and his and his work, and um, and, and we had a blast, didn't we? For I mean, I felt yeah. very old because everybody was like twelve, <laughs> and I was like forty odd, uh, yeah, and, I, and I just I just needed my rest uh, and plenty of naps, <laughs> and uh, and and we had a great time. But but we we did royally cane it a bit at the bar. Um, yeah, it was great. It was absolutely amazing. Would recommend ten out of ten. Yeah, and I think at that point in time we are going back. When was that? Two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen. Oh my days, was it? Sorry. Yeah, because I mean, the past two years haven't really counted. No, they haven't they, counted. But, um, yeah, it must be. It must be about two thousand sixteen. That's 
crazy. And and on that trip, I think we had combined YouTube audience figures of you know, as in subscribers of about four and a half million amongst the, the, the half a dozen of you were there. Joe Joe Dolman was there as well, wasn't he? Guy was there. Um, and Andrew Huang was Hank, there. Andrew, yeah, there? Andrew was there as well. So even back then, that that little group had sort of yeah, it must have been about four and a half to five million combined yeah. subscribers between you. Um, so it was quite a unique Should have set up group. a show, really. I know. I missed, I mean, we we missed out there, didn't we? We really did. I know. Yeah. I know. Anyway, let's let's <laughs> let's. Uh, apologies for the five minutes worth of podcast that nobody understands. Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> start at the beginning. So Hannah, you are a singer songwriter. And that's really how you started out, isn't it? Yeah, yes. nodding doesn't work on a podcast. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I, I started out writing songs in my bedroom um, and then tried to get gigs locally and couldn't because the, the promoter I was speaking to at the time was like, how many tickets can you sell? And I was thinking, how many people do I have as friends and family? And, you know, didn't really have an audience. And so um, and so then I started busking. And then that was really great. And then, I, But then I was still like, how do I grow this? Because I can't, I can't tour nationally if I've only got an audience in one place. And then I, and then I found out about YouTube and then, um, and then found an audience internationally through posting stuff online and it just kind of, went from there and you're from leeds aren't you yeah okay and you used yeah. to bus squat city center of leeds yeah like the main street on brigitte yeah right you're on brigitte were you not the hedrow uh no like buses are a bit brigitte. noisy on the hedrow aren't they <laughs> yeah yeah but you had to run to get your spot oh wow it was you know there were really popular spots and if you didn't run to get them you you'd you had to go somewhere where there was less footfall, and it was really, it was really competitive. Was actually, it? was Crazy, a bit of turf yeah. war thing going on. Absolutely, right. Yeah, I bet you owned it, didn't you? Um, I was quite fast, right. with my little wheels, everything on wheels. <laughs> I used to absolutely peg it down Brigate to get to that spot, and then once I'd got there, very breezy, slowly take everything out of the case. I'm here, I've <laughs> arrived. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, there were there are a couple of spots, but there were there's there's quite a few um, men in the sixties, I think, at the time who who were also running to get the spots. Right. And we used to see each other sometimes, and we used to be like, you know, <laughs> both of us running down. Ah, oh, I've got it. Ah, oh, hiya. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. So, so you said so on wheels. Were... Oh, hang on, I need to ask. Sorry, Jason. You, you didn't have one of those those. Because I've just come back from Spain. I've had a week in Spain, and everybody of a certain age has one of those shopping trolleys. If you yeah, go to that a market, was, me. was that you? Yeah, absolutely. With the granny roller, that was me. Oh. Put my amp in one of them. Everything was strapped together with a bungee rope that I got from B and Q. It was a very professional setup. <laughs> oh, that's a great look. Yeah, that really is great. Yeah. Sorry, Jay, I interrupted. Brand, isn't it? That's all right. The moment's gone. Carry on. Oh, have I ruined? Have I ruined your line? Oh, I keep doing this. <laughs> he hates it's me fine. most of the time. Fine, it's fine. <laughs> I'm just hurt. <laughs> so anyway, you're doing your busking with your with your little yeah. granny trolley uh, yeah. and your little bit of running. Um, did you yeah. not think about setting up some form of mafia style business to you know to rent out the spots? I could have seen you doing that. A bit of underworld stuff going on in Leeds City Centre. <laughs> um. Now that you say that, I'm thinking I really missed a trick there. Um, no, I did not think about doing that. I mean, if I got there at a certain point in the morning and somebody else couldn't get a spot, then I felt a moral obligation to only perform for a certain amount of time and then, you know, swap with someone else. But no, I didn't. Um, I, I wasn't the most powerful busker there, for right. sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you... So you... In your little very quick resume of your story, you said that you discovered YouTube and you started posting videos online, which I'm assuming is, is just stuff in a room, you guitar, singing into a, a phone or a camera or whatever, and just uploading. But that's yeah. 2010, 2011 kind of time? Yeah, yeah, 20, yeah. So you're, you really are on the crest of that wave then, because that's 
fairly early in the YouTube story, isn't it? Yeah, because I think they they only introduced um, 720p HD in 2008 and then full HD 1080 in 2009. And I know that that kind of coincided with them suddenly having like an exponential growth of audience. Um, And at that point is when I started putting videos online. So the timing of it was perfect for me, yeah. And that was, was that covers your own stuff? Mix of the two. Um, yeah, it was a mix. I used I used to do like three, two or three covers, and then an original song or like an original song idea, and then rinse and repeat sort of thing. Right, and that that took off fairly quickly. No, no, <laughs> no. I was doing that for about two, two, two and a half years. Right, um, and I would post once or twice a week, every week. And the views were really low for for like two years. Yeah, really, really low. And then a couple of videos started getting a bit of traction. And then I just kind of upped the the production value, I guess, of the type of videos and the, the audio as well. And that's when things started taking off quicker. Um, yeah, it was really slow to begin with, really right. slow. Right. So were you getting lots of pressure around when are you going to get a proper job kind of thing? Was that going hand in hand with this? Yeah, sort of. So I started busking a year before I went to uni. Right. And I was studying biology and I knew that I had... I basically just thought to myself, I've got I've got a year out, I'm going to busk. Um, if I can't get to the end of the year and support myself just doing that, then I will go to uni. I went to uni and then I was like, in my head I was like, I've got three years to make this into like a sustainable career. Um, So I was busking a lot and I was, and then I started touring nationally and internationally. And then by the time I'd come out, I could just keep going and that was great. But I I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to try to not get a real job. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, how do I, you know, if this needs to move faster or how do I do this so that I can not have a real job by the end of uni, um, which is when all, everybody was supposed to then have a real job. Um, there was like some of my family, I guess, and some of my friends were like, what are you going to do after? And I knew within the first couple of weeks of, of studying biology that it, that it wasn't for me. So it never made sense to go down that route, but I, yeah, otherwise I wasn't sure what, what I would do. Did you finish the degree then? Yeah. Right, so you've got a degree in biology? Yeah, I've got an honours degree in biology. (laughs) Which you've literally done nothing with. Which I... Well, there's certain things that have come off the back of having a degree. Like, I've done a lot of um, guest lectures and some... Like, I'm a senior lecturer at Leeds Conservatoire for emerging music models. I'm not sure that I would have got an opportunities like that if I hadn't gone to uni maybe would have but um I feel like it's a mixture of experience and actually having having got a degree right yeah okay fine right so you finish your degree you've worked mm. out you're not going to work effectively because it's not work is it yeah. you know really <laughs> in, in in most people's no. eyes it's not work is it um this is that thing isn't it like that the the phrase has changed recently, hasn't it? From like find a job you love and you'll never work in your day a day in your life. It's been flipped on its head, hasn't it? Like you'll work every day for the rest of your life yeah. if you find yeah. a job you love. Yeah. yeah, I probably work way more than I would if I had like a nine to five. I think. So where was the money coming from? Was it just coming from the touring, or had you started to generate money from? Was YouTube helping to support you? Yeah, so there was like um during uni. Yeah, well just in this period. So yeah, end so, end of uni and the fact that you made the decision very quickly that you know, your biology yeah. degree wasn't really So I had pivotal. um YouTube revenue. Um there were a couple of things at the time that were like brand deal things. I had a couple of um relationships with production houses in Leeds and 
down south that were making music for adverts and I had a few syncs through them. Um, and then, you know, from merch sales and things like that, it was it was quite narrow. There were only a few revenue streams at that, at that time. Hmm. But, of course, at some point, the music industry started to wake up to what people like yourself were doing. So having had years of, 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 of music instrument manufacturers and, and music retailers really just focusing on acts, uh, as in established, touring, yeah. big, big, they, they suddenly started to look at the, the kind of following that you had. Because you, you, you'd got a decent following in, on, on YouTube at this point. I mean, you were, you know, nudging up a million, weren't you? Yeah, I think, well, there were... I think the views now are on like 140 million views yeah. or something like this. Um, it was more the subscribers then, I was I was I was going for because that's what. I... So the subscribers, I don't. I, I mean, back then I think it was a, I think it was on like two fifty thousand. Right. Um, which, yeah, and a lot, and the the video views were fairly, like consistent across the videos. Um, but I, I wasn't talking to a lot of... It, it, it was so still new. Like, YouTube was still seen as, like, a new thing in yeah. 2012. It was still like, oh, you know, she's putting videos on YouTube. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Well, I mean, I remember when we start. I mean, you know, we talked about going out to Montreux. But that's that's when Shaw started to take some kind of interest in, in what was going on. So that's, what, 2015, 2016. I wouldn't say we were the first to the party, but I wouldn't say we were the last either. Yeah. Um, so even then, you know, four years after you were starting to get good number views, you know, mm. brand music brands were only just starting to get really, really interested. You've got a, you've had a, a long term relationship with Faith, though, haven't you? Faith Guitars. When did that start? Yeah. So that started. Um, my producer used to work in a music shop about ten years ago. Um, and he knew someone who was, I guess, in sales at Barnes and Mullins. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, at Faith. So, and then he was saying, "Oh, um, you know, we were in the studio one day, and I was thinking, oh, I need to get a guitar. What, what kind should I try out?" And he was like, "Have you tried these?" And um, then he kind of introduced me to Alex at Faith and Rob and it was just through an email really yeah and I was just kind of I said it'd be great to come and try them out and then when I did try them out I was thinking my first thought was actually these are way underpriced <laughs> <laughs> I was just like these you know it felt at the time I had a Taylor 614 I just was thinking this this feels actually like of that kind of level um but nobody knew the brand name, or nobody that I knew knew the brand name. Um, so it felt like a bit of an underground, a little secret thing that I found out about, which was nice. And that relationship's been in place ever since, hasn't it? You you still do quite a lot of work with Faith now. Yeah, so I've done some um, performances for them at like the UK Guitar Show and um, some videos and things with them, and at their at their where at their warehouse there. Would you call it a warehouse where they build the guitars? Um, <laughs> where they, where they, the factory, the factory, a guitar um, building place, a guitar building area <laughs> zone. Um, yeah, and yeah, just get, they're just great people as well, and I think that makes all the difference. Like it's it's great to have a, a great product, but at the end of the day, if you don't click with someone, it's it's you, it doesn't tend to be a long relationship. I don't think. No. No, they are they are a lovely, lovely bunch of people. Uh, yeah. They really are. Right, okay. So that gets us... We're sort of 2016, 2017 kind of area. At which point you decide to set up a record label, don't you? Yeah. Okay. And that was... Um... But the, there's been a few sort of instances in my career where I've been like, you know, do I do I do the major route? Do I go independent? Having built it up myself to a point where I could carry on doing music after uni and then and then touring and all this stuff, um, it made sense 
at that point to start releasing more music independently and um teapot records was was kind of like made to facilitate that through a through a distributor Mm. and was it did you do it just for the purposes essentially of making it easy for you to put music out or did because it's not quite that now is it it's 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 mushroomed hasn't it now yeah it has a little bit um originally it was just to kind of house the records that were going out from me but then I started putting music out from other artists under teapot records and then um and then started doing some consulting and and kind of having like groups of people to consult for but then now it also encapsulates um some management like I, I'm working with an artist brand new artist right now and in a management capacity and that's feels like it's kind of fallen under teapot records so it's become it's become something bigger it's hard to describe what it is it's just like a um well, it's a bit a, of a... a house a house for the music i guess it's like a one-stop shop though isn't it because i'm looking at the website now and you've got ment- mentorship uh advice royalty audit which i think yeah. is probably something that people don't really know how to do and yeah. that and that's something you you know i mean i think you know, PPL, PRS is pretty much where artists are making their money now along with tour, And it's only been the only way they've made money in the last couple of years because there's been no touring. So I think it's really important that that's, you know, that advice is given, really. Yeah. Yeah, we recently... Um, so, I, so I work with um, another girl called Anya and we recently did um, an audit for a producer who's got, like, just math credits on some massive massive acts who just never really registered anything or like checked that anything was registered and going through his catalogue and making sure it was all kind of linked back to him I was just like you are gonna get a serious back pay here because this is just crazy um but yeah it's so important to be on top of that but all that admin stuff it's hard to keep on top of when you're an artist because there's so much like it's a full-time job um, just that side of it, if you if you want to kind of make the most of collecting royalties, it's it's just like you've got to be on top of it all the time. And is that just trial and error? Did you learn that just because of your own experiences? Because I don't know where you'd go to learn those kind of you know, the kind of things that you're incorporating with Teapot. I mean, is it just is that just you know the 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 decade and a bit of you doing what you've been doing? Yeah, maybe. Like I think. You know, like when I was when I was um, fifteen, starting to play my own songs, there was no way that I knew of. I mean, I don't know when CD Baby they were one of the first, weren't they, to yeah. kind of make it accessible. But there was no way to put music on on onto the platforms like iTunes at the time, um, unless you were signed. So I ca like through learning about distribution and stuff like that. It it kind of was trial and error because. And then I and then like I always am reading about new tech and new kind of business in terms of music industry stuff and business books and all this kind of thing. So I think it was a bit of trial and error and just like constantly learning about the area that I'm in. Like I'm I'm really interested in the music industry because it's constantly changing and. Um, but I, I found out about PRS and PPL quite early on. I probably probably when I first started, I was like, "Oh yeah, I need to register for that." Right, yeah. cool. <laughs> well, I can really recommend Anne Harrison's book, "The Music Business." It's brilliant, okay. absolutely brilliant, and, and she's lovely as well. She came in and did a talk for some of my students, and she was oh, amazing. I mean, she did this talk about how you don't need a record deal to make money anymore. Because she, mm. while she looks after the prodigy Adele and some of the big names, can't remember. Oh, Robbie Williams, small name, obviously that slipped my mind. Who's that? <laughs> um, yeah. But she also looks after a lot of grime artists who don't have record deals and and don't need them because they're making ten, twenty grand a month via streaming services and and so on. Yeah, she was brilliant. So I really recommend her book. Version eight has just come out. Cool. And. How busy does Teapot keep you then? Um, it's probably ten percent of right. what I do. Um, 
the st- uh, you know, like the mentor and things had to take a bit of a back seat recently because I've been doing more management um, of one particular artist who is making music that's she's she's brand new um but there are a lot of there's a lot of interest in her at the moment and i'm trying to facilitate that as much as possible so the the one off kind of mentorship or the you know um things like that has had to take a back seat because this is moving faster than i thought it would um so yeah but but i would say about 10% 10% because you you've time. got that I mean, to a certain extent, all three of us have, um, but but you probably more than us. That kind of portfolio career thing going on that you're doing. You know, your week will be split into half a dozen things, possibly more yeah. things, and they all contribute to an overall income. And it is it was, and and obviously you can't carve it up to be right. Well, ten percent of my week is this, and ten percent of my week because it doesn't work like that. But yeah. over the course of a month or a couple of months, you will end up doing, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, a portion for each one. So what's your kind of normal couple of months look like then? You know, if, if you're saying teapots, if the mentoring's about, you know, 10%. The management's what sort of level now? Um, in terms of time? Yeah, roughly. Maybe 20%. Right. So where's the rest 15, of the time 20%. going? percent. Um, a lot of time is going into making videos and editing. Well, sometimes editing, although I do delegate that sometimes, um, which makes the process a lot faster. Um, and then, God, I mean, there's a lot of time spent emailing, <laughs> <laughs> like way more, way more than I imagined. Um, I'm, it's hard to say really I think like I always like to keep a certain portion of time for like creating music yeah. but that that has got smaller recently that was the bit I was trying um, to get to actually yeah the the like the creative time there's a lot of things that I feel like I do creatively but some of a lot of that is with with camera and with editing yeah. I f- like that's um probably creative time is about 10% yeah. as well um, I don't know whether that's because I've actually finished my next album. Um, you know, like during the process of writing and recording that, it was a lot higher, but at the moment it's 10% because there's, there's a lot of other stuff to focus on in terms of like just, just getting that released and getting enough visual content to promote that and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, for music it's about 10% at the moment. And of course, when you're, I guess, when you're writing and recording what will become an album, that's not income generating at that point, is it? In quite the same way. No, no. So, yeah, the the kind of focus becomes on. For for me, it's just like how how to get an the recording done in a way that's like the best possible outcome in terms of like audio quality um within a certain budget within a certain time frame as well because if you're a perfectionist like I am and it's really hard to let go of stuff you could spend forever yeah. on something and then suddenly have not generated enough income to pay bills and so yeah. that's something that's on my mind as well when I'm when I'm doing an album because it's such a big project like at, so my next album will have nine songs on and like most albums have like I think between like ten and twelve maybe songs, um, which a major label artist could spend eighteen months making. Like I just don't have the time to do that. So no. yeah, I think you'll find that all the best albums have nine tracks on them. Do they? They do indeed. From the seventies, oh. <coughs> I know you're too young, but actually, some of my favourite albums have just got nine tracks. I went to see. Oh, um, cool. I went to see Steve Earle do a keynote speech. I was, I was going to say a few years ago, quite a few years ago now. And he was talking about how he'd caught his son um, illegally downloading music. And he'd said to his son, which bit of this don't you understand? The house, the car, the pool, that's paid for by people buying my records. And yeah. his son had said to him, um, yeah, but dad, there's only like two or three good songs on any album. Why do I have to buy the whole album to get two or three good songs and he then sort of like said that he sat and reflected on it and 
one of the issues that artists have had is that because a CD holds 74 minutes of material and a, a vinyl would hold 40 minutes of material, that actually artists have been going, well, I can fill it up and put 15, 16, <laughs> 17 tracks on. But actually, yeah. those are the tracks that would have been <laughs> B-sides of singles because they weren't good enough to go on the album. And then what you end up with is a very watered down piece of work. And mm. nine or ten works really well. If they're the, just the nine best songs that you've got, just record yeah. them. Yeah, I think I agree with that. And they'd just get shelved, wouldn't they? Like yeah. nowadays, I mean, nowadays it's like songs <clears throat> getting shelved left, right and centre, but also portions of songs. Like the, the most popular songs on TikTok tend to be under two minutes, which is just mind blowing to me because... When I first started out, the indus- industry standard for a pop song was 3.30, yeah. 3.45. And now, like, if you're going over two minutes, you better be you better be fast to, like, wind it down after that <laughs> because nobody's got time for that. <laughs> well, it never hurt the Ramones, did it? They, they could have got a whole <laughs> album of 15 songs done in half an hour. Yeah. I mean, I'd, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with live shows, like, with new artists, we're going to be in and out of a live show in like half an hour. What? <laughs> well, no, because straight straight back to the pub or what? I mean, what happens then? Well, I don't think that was any different, was it? When you went to see a band do their first tour, they'd do extended versions of every song on the album, wouldn't they? I mean, there'd be guitar solos and bits in in you know yeah, repeats of true. choruses, and you just pad it out. I mean, normally two cover versions. If you're going to see a band do its first headline tour, at least two cover versions. Of something, Did just they? yeah, just to pad it out. Well, you, you got to see. Mean, I haven't seen people doing covers at gigs lately, and it's it's very different. It's very like almost refreshing that it's just completely original stuff. Because it used to, whenever I'd go to a gig like five years ago, there was always a cover yeah. of some kind. Usually, it was a bit off the wall. Like maybe a rock band would do a cover of Whitney Houston. Yeah. You know that was such a novelty then, and it, it's kind of not now, is it? Well, you well, blame the you blame s- the live lounge for that, don't you? Yeah. You know, t- <laughs> yeah. Ooh, let's take a quick song and play it on acoustic. Well, That's a good a idea. Bloody John Lewis adverts, isn't it? Well, it is that. What, Have you seen the new one? I haven't seen it yet. Come on, no. John Lewis adverts are great. They are great, but I haven't seen the new one. Have you seen the new one? Is it out? It now? came out yesterday, I think. Oh. No, is it good? I don't know. I don't know if it work on a podcast for us to have a little watch party of the of the John Lewis advert and all go, ooh. No, you're all right. All right, fine. Just, uh... You can Jason. just make the noises and you can dub it over. Yeah. Whoa, oh, no. <laughs> I don't know how that works, actually, but... <laughs> oh, you are a Grinch, Jace. Oh, no, thank you. Um... <laughs> My children really appreciate it. But, but, but you're right, I mean... Albums now, 35, 40 minutes. How do, you, how do you do a live act based on that? But then again, have we got the attention span for a 90-minute for a, a, a or a 120-minute show anymore? I mean, no. I think like average watch time of a YouTube video is shot down across the board as well. Um, like short-form video has just kind of taken off, hasn't it? In, in, a, in a way that I don't think anybody expected it to, especially vertical video. I, the strange thing about what you've just said there is I agree with that in one breath, but then mm. my kids will sit and watch the most mundane nonsense for extended period of time. <laughs> so Josh plays FIFA, and he, they do these things called... Uh, it's packs, foot packs, where they get players they can use in their FIFA squads, and they will watch for half an hour at a time. He'll watch some YouTuber open his foot packs. and it's And it's just like... I, I, it's like watching paint dry, and and he and awful. he'll do that for half an hour at a time. Or mm. Jack will watch another YouTuber, a, a Zebra Gamer, this guy, and he'll watch him play, you know, a um, a Lego game on on Nintendo Switch, and he'll or he'll watch him play Minecraft for an hour. He'll watch somebody else play Minecraft <laughs> for an hour. Yeah, I don't get that, no. but that's because I'm now. Old. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, no, not you're old, but yes, you are in that respect. No, yeah, we we just it's the, it's just that thing, isn't it? Like the whenever the younger generation start doing something, the older people just go, "What are you doing? 
<laughs> What's it all about? We just don't get it, do we? Well, We're not in that headspace, obviously. Well, I've tried to get the kids into because it, because it's obviously it's going to come up again fairly recently. So, of in, in the future, I've tried to get the kids into the Christmas Radio Times. Okay. Right, so so you sit down with the Radio Times and you go through and you mark in the way we used to. You mark all the things you want to watch, and. And the first time... Yeah, that's... that's. Not... No, they don't watch telly, <laughs> No, but, no, no they... but did, we did this last year, and Josh quite liked it. And he marked all these things and said, right, well, I'm going to go and watch that one now then. And I'm like, well, that's not how it works, Josh. It's it's in a <laughs> yeah, sequence. On <laughs> it's not a Great. It's not a list Love of it. the things that are available. It's actually... It says the date and the time on the top of the page, and he couldn't get his head around it. <laughs> no, why would they? Everything is on demand. Yeah. Not everything... I mean, my my kids. Well, if you watch. want to watch the fourth episode of Columbo series three, you might have to wait and watch it. At... <laughs> <laughs> my kids watch TV with subtitles on now. Because... Oh yeah. yeah. Do you know what? I've heard a lot more people doing yeah, that. Yeah, Jack does because um... they, they don't concentrate enough on the story because mm. the phone's in the hand or something. It's 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 ever so weird. I, I mean, I I can't watch. I can watch a subtitle film. But I can't watch an English subtitle no. film. That just, just defeats the object no. to me. No. Though there are a few yeah. bits from around where you are I could probably need subtitles for. Oh. Me? <laughs> no, Jace. Me or Jason? No, I think he's talking about a black country. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, it's a cheap shot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, we've only got Hannah for another eight minutes. You've got a hard stop at five. And I've still got... Uh, I've, I've got well, one question to ask, actually. Which is, um, you, um, you did a podcast in partnership with Toman. Yeah. Excellent, fantastic. Right, it's been lovely to have you, Hannah. Thank See you. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we did um, a series called Backstage Pass Podcast. We did 50 episodes with experts from within the music industry in different areas, and um, it was really just like a casual chat about pe- different people's experience of working in music. Um which was writ, like illuminating on certain topics for me. Yeah, it was great. And was it strange to be asked by that particular brand? I mean, because they don't have a reputation um, for creative sort of output, do they? I mean, I mean. No, I think that's. I think it's changing. Um, I think previous to like the podcast, I don't think they did. Um, whereas, like now, there's a lot of different like series of for them on particularly with like guitars and um drums on YouTube and and a lot of a lot of stuff on Instagram as well but it was something kind kind of like out of the blue i was about to start talking to different people and doing like little conversational YouTube videos and i'd posted something about this on my Instagram stories um didn't realize that that Terman followed me or anything like that but I got a message from them saying, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, I'm thinking about doing this thing. And um, and they were like, that sounds great. Do you want to do it together? And I was like, oh, like this could be really cool. So it was kind of, it kind of happened really organically. But yeah, it wasn't somebody who I would have imagined at that time would have wanted to work with me. No. Um, yeah. And are you are you missing it? When when did when did it finish? Um, well, we're just doing a break right now. Right. So I, I do I make another series for them called Music Without Theory, which is about um, trying to encourage people to make music in a way that isn't too kind of overwhelmed with theory knowledge. Yeah. Um, we we kind of did a pause on the Backstage Past podcast in. I feel like it was earlier this year. It might have been March. Right. Um, yeah. But that's coming back. There's 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 plans to do more of that. Yeah, possibly. I think that there are certain areas within the music industry that I don't think we've spoken to experts there yeah. yet. So I'd like to yeah, I'd like to do some more kind of conversations with with more people in more niche areas. So we'll see, yeah. Okay. And what do you... After all of this and everything we've touched on, because we've, we've gone a little bit scattergun and there's been a lot of things we've, we've touched on a little bit, but 
what do you what what how would you define yourself now um my career is in an interesting point <laughs> um i think i was i was very relaxed and safe in like my early 20s just being an artist um and now it's it's you know i've got my artist career um i'm doing these guest lectures on emerging music models about like generating revenue in different ways and through things like nfts and the chinese music market and and i'm writing a book and i'm doing these brand deals for my own youtube channel and doing videos for other products and other other brands channels um and the guest lectures and everything like that. I, I'm not really sure what I would say. I think I always wanted to have like a sustainable and long-term career in music and that's what I'm doing, but I don't know what the overall name would be, yeah. especially with the management stuff. Like, You would think that that would really clash with my artist project, also managing another artist who's actually in a really similar genre. But because we're going down a major label route with her, yeah. it's... Is very two very kind of separate worlds of music. Um, I guess like, I guess like I'm a content creator and a musician, just music person. It says entrepreneur on your um, website. I mean, yeah, like, uh, all that kind of is all encompassing these days for so many different things, isn't it? So maybe we should just run with that. <laughs> <laughs> Musicpreneur. <laughs> music printer yeah music printer i like that go with music printer hannah it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much uh for for finding the time um and hopefully I'd, I'd, Thanks for I'd, me. well we'd we'd like to think that a we might see if you'd like to come and do the guitar show when when it kicks off again if if that's something that'd be interesting and you'd, you'd, yeah, you'd that'd be uh, great. like to be there but but also that maybe we could check back in again on the podcast further down the line and just catch up because you could have done 10 or 15 different things you know given six months yeah yeah probably <laughs> yeah yeah i'm kind of um there's so many other things that are that are on the back burner at the moment that really interest me that at some point whenever i get the time i want to dive into them too so i'm sure there'll be new things to talk about next time i see you but we should definitely get tea cakes going for that oh yeah as well, well we're, we're way overdue we'll do tea cakes <laughs> very very soon uh thank you very much yeah. and uh, look forward to seeing you next time Thank you. Cool. You too. Thanks. And that was Hannah Trigwell. Um, and we've let her dive off because she had a hard, she had a hard stop at five. Yes, yeah, so well, um, she's got a young daughter, hasn't she? And we've all been she there. She has. We've all been there. So we'll, we'll wrap up. But um, what an amazing amount of stuff she's packed into what? not much over a decade. I, it's, well, it's just incredible because what she said, she's like late 20s or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is just mental, given that she started doing this in what two thousand and ten, two thousand and eleven, something like that. Uh, and and we've had two years out effectively from any form of career. Um, incredible. And and still managed to fit in a biology degree that she doesn't need. Well, yeah, degrees. I think that's showing off. If I'm being honest, <laughs> just just a little bit, a yeah. little bit of showing off. Um, we need to remember to thank our friends at Focus Right. We do. Um, thank you. Thank you, Focus Right, and uh, happy birthday, Rich. Um, I'll see you next week for a coffee. Oh, are you having a coffee with Rich next week? Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Pass him my best. I will. Okay. And hopefully the next time that we, we, uh, we talk, we won't both sound quite so nasally. Yeah. Yeah. This is just the joys of being back out in public, isn't it? It's yes. not COVID, because I have to... Lateral flow test three times a week, so I haven't got COVID. It's just a stinking cold. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's the the colds that are floating around are bloody horrible at the moment. They just. I thought Monday, Tuesday. I thought oh, it'd be a twenty four hour thing. I'll shake it off by Tuesday, and it's just still hanging around five past five on Friday evening. Yeah, bloody awful. Yeah, well, I thought I got over it. I had it last week, got over it early part of this week, and it started with a vengeance again yesterday. Yeah, horrible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, should we go and? Uh, Go and have a lemsip. Go and have a lemsip. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll go and have a lemsip, and and I'll uh, I'll catch you next time. All right, mate. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.
Thanks for listening to 9 to 42, the podcast from the team at the Guitar Show UK. If you've enjoyed the show, then please remember to hit the subscribe button and share with other like-minded souls. For more information about 9 to 42, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at the Guitar Show UK. This has been an A Short Stories production. Thank you.